All right, Jason, we're live. Good to be with you, brother. John, great to see you again. Thanks for having, back and having me back on your show. It was an easy yes. The minute this opportunity became available, I, I a team probably should have had, you know, a recording of my reaction because it was the fastest <laughs> yes um, to date. I really enjoyed our previous conversation. I think it's worth people going back and taking a listen. I know things have evolved and changed uh, since then. But, you know, I've got to tell you this. Um, I got to tell you this right away. There were things you said in that conversation that I have repeated word for word. And I think about the impact of conversations and I often will assess the value of that conversation in, in parts of my life by how many times I will repeat something that was said or something that was discovered. And it was a transformational conversation. I want to thank you for that. And I also want to thank you for being back today. Well, I really appreciate it. And obviously I enjoyed being on your show because that's why I'm back. <laughs> yeah, man. Let's give um, let's give a little context here. Um, and and where I want to start is your childhood, um, sure. uh, because I want to talk for a minute. And I think there's real value in this, man, for for dads who listen to this show or moms or whoever's listening mm -hmm. to remember who we were as kids. Like there's uh -huh. so much value in remembering ourselves at seven, nine, eleven, whatever, because. Uh, you know, who are the mentors in our lives? Who are the warning signs in our lives, the defining moments? So just give us a little picture of your life as a child. So when I think about my life um, as a child, I actually did a TEDx talk on this called the Hot Lava Talk. Oh, really? I, where, I, where I actually compared my life as a child to Ryan's life, mm. my son. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. And when we talk about why we, how we got to the mental health crisis we're in today, which is, as you probably know, the largest we've ever had, a lot of it has to do with the world's changed so much. So when you ask that question, I actually think about it a lot. See, when, when I was a kid, and I'm 56 this year, so slightly older than you by 20 or 30 years. A couple years, a couple years. <laughs> so it was a whole different world. So if you, if you go back to when I was seven or eight or nine, well, you know, I don't really remember all that much, but I was young. I didn't like going to school. I was a sickly kid. I had asthma. I had allergies. I was allergic to chalk dust. And back then there were no whiteboards for chalkboards. Right. And the big thing was clapping the, the racers together. I totally remember big, that. Big bringing dust cloud in this, in the classroom. Right. So I'm like blowing through Kleenex and I'm sick and I'm the last person to be ever um, picked at any kind of sport because I was the least athletic guy on the planet. Um, and I was just sick and I was alone. Didn't have a lot of friends. That's how I grew up. Um, and I, and my gosh, I probably attended half the school I was supposed to. I, I became an expert at finding ways to not go to school because I just hated it so much. I can relate it to was, that. It made me sick. I mean, it just literally made me physically ill. Um, so then I look back, okay, when I was, 13 or 14 compared to, you know, Ryan being 13 when he passed or 14 when he passed. Look at, it was a different world. I grew up in Canada. There were two TV channels. So like you get home from school, you watch like Get Smart in Gilligan's Island, which you probably don't remember any of those, but <laughs> that's what we used to watch. No, totally. Totally. I do. Yeah. Gilligan's Island for sure. Both, both great TV shows, but you watch those and you're done, right? There's nothing else to do. So your mom kicks you outside and you play and, the, and you see the memes all the time. You hear all the stories like we get on our bikes, we drive for hours, we come back, we get stark. Parents don't know where we are. We're jumping over, you know, we're building ramps and jumping our bikes with no helmets as high as we could go, as far as we could go. And then we sometimes have our friends line up in between so we can jump over them. Things that we would all just go, what the hell are our kids doing now? But that's how we grew up, right? Right. Um, because there weren't, you know, obviously there's no computers, there are no iPhones or anything to keep us busy. It was board games. It was reading books. It was the two TV channels and going outside and playing and make, and make believe. And that's what we did. And then the biggest thing that's hard for a lot of people to realize is that when the phone rang, well, it was attached to the wall. My father would answer it. And he'd decide if you got to speak to the person on the other end of the phone. That's right. And then when he'd decide, he'd stand there and listen to your conversation until you hung up and say, I'll talk to you at school tomorrow. 
that was it. Yeah. But as crazy as that sounds, it was, it was actually really cool because you felt safe. Yeah. So my, I was bullied constantly. I mean, I mean, that's just how it was. I was bullied. I was, I was a sickly kid, but my bully stayed at school. So when I came home, it was safe. Right. It was totally safe. Well, relatively safe. It was safe to my bullies, but yeah, I didn't, I don't think when I, I don't look back on my life with fond memories. Um, but you know, I also didn't worry about a lot of stuff. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think about, you think about kids today, right. And your kids at their age right now, John, they know about global warming. They may be feeling that the world's going to come to an end in 10 years because people have said that online and they've read it. Um, they may think there's going to be a nuclear war in a month and a half because people say it online. They may think that you name it, that you know there's going to be a, a massive financial crisis and they'll never be able to afford a house and it's stupid to go to school. And you're going to, I mean, all these things that go through their heads today never went through mine. Because when I was 13, you didn't watch the news. Your father or mother watched the news. The news, well, you don't read the paper. Why the hell would I read the paper? I'm focused on where I can go build a tree fort. <laughs> like, that's really all I cared about. Yeah. And how to ditch school. Those are the things that matter to me. So I wasn't thinking or worried about a lot of stuff. And you think about all the pressure on kids today, they, what they think about on a daily basis. And then social media. I didn't, what do I care what anyone else wears? Right? My mother bought me jeans. They never fit. And no one cared because we all had the same problem. The kids today is like, oh my gosh, if they're not dressed the right way at this at school, there was not a fashion, there was no fashion police when I grew up. There were none. Maybe in high school, maybe a little bit, but not really. I don't remember buying a single piece of clothing until I went away to college and I just bought clothes because I had to wear them. Right? We didn't care about those things. We didn't care about how our hair looked. We didn't care about anything. We just we we were just out there. So all the pressure on kids, and then you take a look at it. I hope I'm not going on too much, John, but this is. You're making some really, really good points. And I think a lot of our listeners are going to be able to uh, appreciate. And my hope is they're reflecting as you're sharing about their own experience as a kid and how the world has changed and what our kids are facing. So please keep going. So then you think about like sports. Like, like there were guys in Canada that were going to play hockey at a, at a, at a higher level, right? But most of us were just playing hockey. And most of us play in the backyard and most of us didn't care about anything else. There was, there was no talk about getting a scholarship. You might know somebody who thought they were going to make it in the NHL, but most of the part, we just played hockey. Right. And then, and that was about it. I mean, there was, there was other sports, but whatever. Right. You never heard about the, the, the girls doing 17 hours worth of gymnastic practice in a week, which is the norm. Now, if you want to be an elite level gymnast, never heard about that kind of stuff. 17 hours a week. Oh, there's, there's wow. my niece. My niece was doing 16, 17 hours a week years ago. Oh my goodness. But that didn't happen when I grew up, right? And, and when, when you grew up, probably not either. And so, and all this pressure to become an athlete to get a scholarship, why? Because school's so damn expensive that how are your parents going to pay? So I better get a scholarship. So I better excel at school and I better excel at sports. I better find something to excel at or I won't get into college or I'll be having these massive student debts I hear about on the news all the time. And then it's hard to get into college. I always joke with my business partners who all went to UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara. Because right now, if they wanted to get in there, it's like a 4.4 GPA. Mm -hmm. There's not a chance in hell any of those characters would have ever went to UCSB. I think they had 2.5 on the guy. Yeah. And because we didn't have to worry about going to college and what the grades were because everybody just kind of went to college if you wanted to. And if you didn't want to, no one cared. So you, you take a look at that world, right? The things that we didn't have to worry about never crossed our minds. And now you compare it to the world our kids are growing up in today. And there's no question in my mind why they are so anxious and so sad and so frustrated and so quick to snap yeah right because they have all this stuff going on and their little brains are no different than my little brain that was like i'm gonna go outside i'm gonna jump over my friends on my bike and i'm gonna find a spot to build a new tree for yeah 
singularly purposed. How do I find a new tree for it? <laughs> like, yeah, that was the world I grew up in. I'm smiling as you're sharing this because your timing for this for this walk down memory lane and and looking at our lives as kids. Um, you know, I'm talking to Tiger, who's my 13 year old, two weeks ago, and however the conversation come up, we started talking about MacGyver and yeah. the TV show. <clears throat> then we oh, start. Then we start watching it together. Yeah. And dude, we are watching this show that launched in 85, right? We start with episode one. And I was explaining to Tiger that when I watched this show, it was like, it was only on at whatever time it was, seven, eight o'clock, something like that. It was it. So you, you had to be- it, You missed it. Till you missed it. You missed year. it. Dude, we didn't even record it at that point. Like there was well, just couldn't. nothing. It was There's just, you missed recording. it, you missed it. So dude, I'd be looking forward to it. I would be watching, like I was, I was waiting, I was practicing patience, you know, and then the show would come on. And then I remember telling him, cause it hit me when we were watching the episode that when, you know, when, when the scene or when, you know, they do do a little teaser in the beginning, they like loop you into the story. And then they play the theme music for MacGyver and they they roll the whatever 30 second, 45 second intro. That's the same one every time. I said, Tiger, right in that moment when they rolled that intro, I would jump up off the couch and I would run to the kitchen to get a snack. And I remember hearing the music in the background running and I knew how much time I had to get the snack because I had to be back before it started because there's yeah. no pause. There was no way to pause. So we were having this whole conversation about what it was like for me as a kid watching this show, not being able to record it, having to wait until next week, only being able to watch one and not binge watch seven seasons of something. Like it was an incredibly, uh, you know, nostalgic conversation for me, but I started to see how different his world is right now from that world for me. Like I remember when Pong first came out, we got it for Christmas and my brother and I spent like five hours playing Pong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. And so they were like, why would you ever play that? What, yeah. what, what's the purpose of that? And we spent five hours going, that's the best thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. You, you were, I think that taking a walk down memory lane for yourself and thinking about your life and how different it was than Ryan's talk to us. Uh, let's fast forward to this moment today. Talk yeah. to us about what's going on for you uh, in life you know, and I know that it's all kind of blended together. So I'll say, give us a peek into your personal and professional world because it all ties together. What's happening for you in 2023? So I am hyper busy. Um, I've always been busy. I'm probably busier than I ever had been though. So my core business national services group with my partners, um, we're having just an amazing year across four different construction brands. We employ about 2000 people. We're wow. growing by 25% this year. Um, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I own a few other companies that I've invested in and bought into in the last couple of years that are, are they were small and now they're growing. And now I'm like, oh, now they take more time as they're growing. Um, I'm still coaching about 17 clients through CEO coaching international where I coach CEOs around North America on different businesses. So from a business standpoint, my, my, um, my life's full, very, very, very full. And, and, and people always say, well, how the heck do you do all that stuff? Well, first of all, I get up at four 30 in the morning and I start work at five every morning when Saturdays and Sundays around six, at least Saturdays around six. And I work till six or seven at night. And I also have amazing teams of people who work with me, executive teams in all those businesses. So I only spend my days doing what I want to do and I don't have to do a lot of stuff. And I've, I've created my life by my design and my design is I want to be here every day to help and support people. And I don't want to do any tasks. I don't want to be involved with customer service or, or anything. I just want to support the people who are doing all the work. So that's how I spend my days business wise. Um, personally, um, let's see, we've got, I'm still very involved. We have uh, Oak Hollow Studios. We're doing documentary films, um, music videos. We have a new album coming out with BMG Music, which I think you might really enjoy. It comes out this month. We did a BMG actually came to us and said, will you guys do a 10 song album on mental health? Wow. So we created something called uh, Songs for the Drive Home that is out this month. And by the time this airs, I will have you a link for it. And it's 10 songs and 10 videos. Side A is for younger kids. Side B is for older kids. 
but it's designed to be kind of like the old um, Jack Johnson um, Curious George album where you're, you're, yep. you're, you'd listen to the songs with your kids. So we wrote the songs in that vein, but each song has a different twist on mental health. And what it's meant to be is a conversation starter between you and your kids. Mm. So you'll listen to the songs. The songs are, I think the songs are really cool, but they have a meaning behind every song. And there's 10 videos that go along with all 10 songs. So this, we're really excited about this because the big question I get about mental health with kids is always like, Jay, I get it. You want me to connect with my kids. I've got to help my kids. I've got to be the person I understand, but they won't talk to me. And then they say, well, they sometimes talk to me in the car on the drive home. So songs for the drive home is to help spark that. Like put this on. Side A, if you got younger kids. Side B, if you got older kids. And side A and B, you and I understand, but so if that would be on albums, they have a side A and a side B. Just yeah, yeah. Um, so our audience will get that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so anyway, so that that's what that's all about. And I'm, I'm really excited about how that comes. So we've got that going on. Um, and then we got all the mental health stuff going on and, and, and it's evolved a lot. Um, but before I get there, family wise, uh, Kim and I will be married for 30 years this year which is, you know, uh, a feat unto itself without having lost a child. And um, so we're really happy about that. Ashlyn is 23 and she's getting married this year. And Derek is 26 and he's getting married this year. And Kyle is 21 and he is a, um, he's a YouTube guy. So I actually had a lot of fun doing a boxing match with him where he, we spent three months training to box his dad. No way. And he is like 110 pounds and never done anything I like in his life. So there's a whole there's a whole 45 minute documentary film he made about boxing me. Whoa. It's kind of a hero's journey thing. It's actually really cool. That's cool. Um and he kicked my ass. Yeah, I was gonna okay, it was my gonna be my next question. No, I, I no one thought he would, and I didn't think he would either, but he actually trained and I did. Wow. So um makes so a difference. Cool. So, and then, you know, Derek is my top sales guy, one of my one of my top sales guys at one of my companies, and Ashland's doing amazing and and they're all within an hour. Yeah. So from a family standpoint, I couldn't really ask for it to be any better. Perfect. I mean, I could because if Ryan was back. Of course. But considering the, the cards we've been dealt, uh, I couldn't ask for it to be better. Yeah. Wonderful to hear, man. Yeah. That's great. And, and what about, uh, let, let's, let's actually take a minute, because um, we've mentioned his name a couple of times. I like to go back and give some context to some of the work you're doing in the mental health space, but for anybody who didn't listen to our first interview um, or perhaps wasn't paying attention during our intro, uh, let's walk through a little bit of the story, whatever you'd want to share, Jason, to get us to this point of why you're so passionate about this work. Yeah. So um, it's five years ago, March and Ryan had just turned 14 couple weeks ago before on the 12th and kim and i were on vacation in mexico and ryan sent us a text to say goodbye and that night he took his life we had five days we raced back as best we could it took a little longer than i wanted obviously because at two in the morning no matter how much money you have or how who your friends are you're not leaving mexico there's no planes. Um, but we had four days with him in the hospital. Let's say goodbye. Um, and that's what we did. So when that happened, um, do you have options? Um, there's a lot, and we all have options, right? But you have choices to make. Everybody grieves differently. And some people will dive into the bottle and drugs and, and I, and I don't blame them for it because it crossed my mind a whole bunch of times. 85% of people get divorced because it's just too much for a reminder to stay with the same person. Um, some people become very insular or very cocooned um, and very private. My wife has become very private um, and that's how she deals with her grief. I went to the extreme side and the day I came back, I was going, I want to start a foundation. I want to make a difference because that's how I am. Like I do all this stuff and I, and I want to make a difference. And I said, what do I want the world to do? What did I want Ryan to do? I wanted Ryan to choose life over death. 
So I found the website choosefelife.org. It was available. It was ten thousand dollars, and I bought it. And I went, God, that's a lot of money. And why is that? And it wasn't until four or five months later, someone reminded me that was the old anti-abortion site, which served me fine for a bunch of years because no one was really paying attention to that fight up until recently. And so I was able to, to run with that site for probably about three and a half, four years. And just because originally that name was about saving lives through suicide, from, from suicide and mental, aware, mental health awareness, not anti-abortion. But at a certain point, you go like, I don't want to get in a fight in the airport because I'm wearing a t-shirt. So because apparently I can't box, found that out. <laughs> so it's interesting though how things have evolved. And when I was on your show originally, um, although I can't remember every bit of it, I know where I was at that moment in time. And so when I found a Choose Life, I went this idea that I wanted to end teen suicide by the year 2030. And I put that out there big time. And the people I had advised me at the time said, what a wonderful idea. Um, which is a great lesson in, you know, don't surround yourself with people who aren't going to question you. Right. Right. Because someone should have said, Jay, that's not a great idea. You need to think about that because I was angry. I was arrogant. And I assumed that everybody in the space was doing a bad job because, Hey, raising awareness. We're already aware. Everybody knows that suicide exists. Everybody knows we got a problem with our kids. I assumed that I could go in there and fix the world. And I think that um, I've grown up a lot since then. And here's what I realized. There's a lot of great people in this space. A lot of people doing a really, really good job and making a huge difference every day. But unfortunately, in the last couple of years, this problem's gone away from everybody. And this problem is bigger than it's ever been. We are in the largest mental health crisis of our time, of our lives, of our history, not just in the United States, but across the world. And we're not winning. We're losing. And we're not losing because there's bad people. We're losing because there's not enough people. There's simply not enough therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists and in-person, out-person, whatever you want to say, there's not enough people to help our kids. And even if you say there's therapists, you've got to realize that there's therapists and then there's therapists. There's therapists who go, hey, I'll deal with your, your, um, your marriage counseling because that's easy. I can tell you you're right. I can tell you you're wrong. No, no harm, no foul. Maybe you get divorced. I don't have to feel bad about it. If you get someone who wants to deal with mental health, there's a risk to them emotionally because if they lose you, how are they going to feel? So the amount of people actually want to play in that space isn't that big. And then are they a match for you or your child? Or your spouse. So it's such a small pool of people that are capable and trained to actually deal with this. Part of the reason why we have such a big problem. So about a year ago, I started looking at this going, okay, what do I want to do? We go through COVID, go through all that stuff. Jay's, I'm, you know, my business are doing fine. I'm, 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 but I still feel a calling to do more. And you can't get away from a calling. A calling is just like, that's what you're supposed to do. So you're just going to, so I decided I'm going to stop fighting it. So I transformed my mission from ending teen suicide to something that's a little more realistic. And that is um, what our new website, by the way, is tellmystory.org um, based on the first movie. And the mission is to educate parents and help parents understand that if you want to save your kids or your spouses or anybody when it comes to mental health, you need to own your kids' mental health the way you own their physical health because no one else is going to do it for you. And by the way, my goal of ending teen mental health or teen suicide by the year 2030, I had a plan. And I'll tell you right now that it's totally, it, the plan would work. Here's the plan. We just have to fix all the doctors in the medical community, the government, all the schools, social media, educate all the parents, and fix all the kids. If we did those five things, we will end teen suicide. It's only five. <laughs> but that's, six. How, that's how angry and arrogant I was. I actually thought that I could change the government. But I was, I was angry, right? 
And I have come to a very unfortunate conclusion over the last couple of years is that the government's not going to change. They're throwing, they're supposedly throwing money at mental health. Go, go ahead and try to find it. I mean, it's, it's like in these weird programs and it gets swashed around and it's not, and they're not making the, 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 the government's not making the difference they should. They're not legislating, although I think they just came out with legislation about um, about social media finally. They're not pushing back on social media the way they should. They're not, they're, they're not going to fix it. They're not going to help us. The, the schools are so overwhelmed, right? It's not the fault of the principal. It's not right. the fault of the teachers. In fact, here, here's the challenge, right? So I go to talk to teachers or principals about my new film, which we'll get to in a minute. Say, yeah, I'll bring this into your school. And they go, you know, you're, you're right, Jay. We totally need to do that. And we had like three overdoses and one death from fentanyl in the last month. And I've got pregnant teens and I've got kids who aren't going showing up and I got a meth problem. I don't know what to deal with first. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're great people. They're overwhelmed. Right. So this is where I keep coming back to, okay, so I need to help talk to parents. I need parents to understand that, you know what, if you're waiting for somebody to help your kids, uh, they're not there. You need to actually take charge of this yourself. And that's where we came up with the next film. Am I, am I rambling on too much? This is perfect. So I was going to ask you what the difference is between the tell my story film. And the next one is what I wish my parents knew. Right. Yep. Which is, so I want to say when I referenced the conversation earlier that we had, and I said, there was something that you said that I have repeated. It was this concept that I took away from our first conversation, which is what, when you talk to survivors who had attempted suicide, they had said something about their parents pushing harder. It was an engagement. Like I wish my parents were more engaged, right? Things that parents could have known, um, you know, and, and what they wish their parents would have done perhaps, or what they would have known that, that to me was the point of that, that, affected me deeply and has now affected our group, you know, impacted our group in a very positive way. So I just wanted to say that, but tell us the difference between the two films. So tell my story is up on Amazon prime and Apple and all the streaming services, I guess. I mean, most of them are a lot of them. I have no idea, but it's up there and it's a documentary drama where you get to see me going and talking to kids, talking to parents, talking to doctors, talking, flying around the West coast, talking to people. And you can see it, it cuts to there's the space needle and there's some pictures of people playing in the park and blah, 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 blah. It's a very well done documentary. And, and if you're concerned about the, your kids or anybody in your life, I really do suggest you watch it um, because it's going to give you a good starting place to think about mental health. But the most compelling piece to tell my story was not me, was not the doctors. It was the kids. Yeah. When the kids start talking and telling you how they feel or yeah. how they felt, you're like, holy cow. So with what I wish my parents knew, I wanted to do a school program. And so I interviewed eight kids in Las Vegas last June. And just in a green screen kind of studio environment, just me and them, you can see the lights, so you can see the green screen. You can see, it's not, you're not cutting to kids playing in the park, right? And this is just me in a very raw conversation with the kids and talking about their mental health, talking about how old they were when they first realized what happened talking about why they, how they got where they were in their darkest moments, what did it feel like? And then how did they bring themselves back out and where are they now? So there's an arc to the whole thing. What it's meant to do is grab a parent and say, wow, that could be one of my kids. One of the things I learned and I just, I shocked the heck on me. A young girl, I think she was 11 when we interviewed her talks about when she was seven years old wanting to throw herself out of a car door on the freeway and tried to open the door but the car locks were on i didn't know john i i thought i thought ryan must have felt that way when he was 12 13 going through puberty things in his life going to middle school and i missed it but these kids are all saying they're seven eight nine years of age and they're feeling that they are different there's something in their lives they know they're not the same as everybody else, and they don't know how to articulate it. 
And if you look at the stats now, it's getting younger and younger and younger where kids are getting into the hospital at seven, eight, nine years of age with attempts. Wow. That's hard to wrap my brain around. Yeah, because when I grew up, buddy, there wasn't any conversation about suicide. It didn't really happen that much. I mean, I'm sure it happened, but it was such a rare thing. There was not a conversation. For all the reasons I probably told you, is that we just didn't, there wasn't, there wasn't the pressure, right? So what I wish my parents knew is a school program where you come and you can watch the film. And then we bring in a mental health professional for 45 minutes to talk to you about what you saw and talk to you about how you can talk to your kids. We then can send you to tellmystory.org, which we're still developing out and pushing. Well, it'll be probably hopefully finished next 60 days or so. We want to have it to be the premier site for resources for parents. So I've got different partners on there. We've got different videos on there. We've got different conversation starters on there. Um, just a way to help. So I've gone from this whole idea that I want to change the entire world, which uh, I think that at a certain point in your life, you realize maybe you're not going to do that. To here's the piece that I think I can help. Yeah. And that is helping educate parents. And that is exactly where you and I align and why Front Row Dads means so much to me is, you know, and I think about all the challenges of the world I, I keep, if I go keep reverse engineering it back to the core, to the nucleus, you go, <clears throat> it always, for me, lands into mom and dad or the parent or the parents of a child and that period of time where they can nurture their children, where they can, and, and by the way, not just under the age of 18, but to always look at your life as a father and a mother, just a different stage where you're always mentoring, you're always guiding, you know, I, I think that's the important piece of it is like, it just starts at home. I feel like when I say that, it sounds a little bit like a platitude, but it's true. That's the nucleus, right? It's, mm -hmm. it begins with dad doing the work on himself, mom doing the work on herself, parents taking the initiative to grow themselves, and then going back and being engaged and present with their families to connect with their kids, you know, and not... And I feel I have a lot of regret about my early years with my kids where I definitely handed them screens, you know, to, because I just felt overwhelmed and busy. And I'm not poking at parents for the choices they make because I know everybody's in interesting situations. But I did, I did the same thing. So. Yeah, I, I but for my own evolution as a person, I now realize how how I with the knowledge and information I have, I can be so much better of a dad, in my opinion today than I could ever before. And even in this day, Jay, as we talk, I'm sitting here and I'm still wrestling with Tiger at 13 and how much screens he's allowed to do, what he's allowed. Like, I have so many questions around it. I'm, I'm in this space. I'm like deeply invested and I still struggle around this topic. And I, I think we all do, right? Because you, it's the genie set of the bottle, buddy. You can't, you, there's no going back to there's no screens. And this is where I get a kick out of some people that, you know, even some of my friends go, I'm just not gonna let my kids have any screen time. I'm like, okay, good, good. And then at what point do they just hate your guts? Yeah. It's like, it's like when we grew up and the parents that would stop their kids from having any kind of chocolate bars or candy or soda, when they come over to my house, they just gorge themselves and they gain like 50 pounds by the time they finally got out of the house, right? Because they're like, okay. you kept it away from them so much. That was my buddy, Brian. I, I ate all of his Pop-Tarts. I'm like, can I try this one? Can I try that one? Six Pop-Tarts later. Yeah, and because yeah. you're not allowed to have it. Yeah. Right? Or or the parents who, I mean, I, and this is probably a topic that a lot of people don't agree with, but, um, you know, when you act like your kids aren't going to drink when they're 17, 18, 19, even though you did, and the dream yeah. age 21, you're like, you can't do that. You're not going to do that. Well, gosh, those are the kids who end up in hospitals because they drank too much. Or those are the kids who drink and drive and have problems. It's not the ones who are taught how to drink responsibly, even though we know they're not legally supposed to drink. Right? It's like, yeah. like if you don't teach your kids how to drink responsibly, they're going to do it anyways. And you're not going to like the result. Yeah. And it's the same thing with screen time. Right? If you don't, you got to teach your kids how to be responsible. And I, I mean, you can limit screen time or you can maybe just let them do whatever the hell they want and they'll get tired of it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do something else because it's like anything else. If you love lobster and you can have unlimited amounts of lobster, 
And that's the only thing you're going to eat. Eventually you're going to go, man, I hate lobster. I'm done. Yeah. I wonder about that. I have like, my body goes yes and no. Like there's a part of me that realized it was like Nintendo for me. Like when my parents were just like play at one point, it was like, it was a snow day, play as much as you want. I think we just burned ourselves out. We're like, I'm done with this. Exactly. Um, and then I think it, what's different about the phone is that there's like an endless array of things to stimulate. Like even yes. at, at my age now, I still find myself getting caught by anything that's stimulating on the internet. It doesn't matter what it is, like Instagram, Facebook, all these things, they know what to feed me because they know what I'm interested in. Um, and it just feels like a bottomless pit. And, and you're absolutely right. And I don't disagree with you. And that is the difference between as much lobster as you want, or here's this amazing buffet of all the food in the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because you probably won't get tired of the buffet because you can eat every day anyway. Yeah. So, but it is, it is such an interesting topic. Like, I mean, yeah. I just don't think that when you, if you're going to say to your kids, you can't do that, it's going to work very well for you. Yeah. I, so the, the approach I'm taking with tiger and this isn't prescriptive guys, this isn't me telling you how to be a dad. And I'm, I'm not trying to be prescriptive either. Yeah. <laughs> this is me just revealing my current place is that I, I, my whole thought is that between 13 and however long I've got his attention, right. Um, is that is to have the conversations like we've been talking about now to ask the questions. I want to get back to what I wish my parents knew. So I want to talk more about that. Um, because I think this ties in is, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm weaving actually a couple of things together back to our original conversation of like, I wish my parents would have pushed harder. I wish they would have gotten engaged a little more. Um, that's what I heard, whether those were your words or not. That's what I heard. And with tiger. Now I bring up everything to him. I'm like, we just had this conversation where we went for a walk and I'm like, dude, let's talk about everything. Let's talk about the things that a lot of dads are never going to talk to their kids about. And I said, we're going to, we're going to have this, I want to have this legendary relationship with you rooted in trust. And I want you to be able to talk to me and listen, I know I'm not your best friend. I know things are down. I know I'm your dad. I get it. I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to make this something it's not, mm -hmm. but I am calling in what I want it to be. And I'm telling you directly my intention for our relationship and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you questions. Tell me what you know about this. Tell me what you know about fentanyl. Tell me what you know about porn. Tell me what you know about this. And I'm just like opening it up and I'm looking at it like, rather than you can't drink, you can't drink, you can't drink. By the way, you're 21. Have fun. I'm like, yeah, let's talk about all of these things. Let's introduce you to these things slowly in a safe environment so that you are aware, you are conscious, you do know, right? This is what I wanted to share with them. And you know, drugs, like, hey, dude, you know, chances are somebody's going to offer you something. You're going to be curious. I think that's great, by the way. I think there's actually some drugs out there you should do. <laughs> like, this is my conversation with him. I actually think there's drugs out there you should try. I just want you to come to me first and ask me because I'd rather you even like you'd get them from a safe source than try something under the table where you're afraid and you try it and then you realize that. You know, there's there's dangerous stuff like kids are dying of fentanyl. Um, so I said, I want to talk about this with you. You know, I think, John, that's that's the relationship that I think every parent should strive to have with their kids. So I will be prescriptive. Do what John's do. I mean, honestly, that's what you should. If you want your kids to be able to feel open to tell you anything and then you want them to not feel judged. And I'll give you, I think you and I talked about the last podcast, but for those who aren't going to, I mean, don't, you don't need to watch the, watch the other one. I'll just tell you one of the most important things I've always tell people is that I live in Southern California and it's generally sunny every day, right? At least in the summertime, not a cloud in the sky. If I was sitting here looking out my office window with somebody who's depressed at a clear sky, they're only going to see clouds. And there's nothing I can say to change the fact that they see clouds. They're only going to see clouds. And if I try to tell them, look, dummy, there's no clouds in the sky. What the hell are you looking at? They're going to, oh, okay, yeah, there's no clouds in the sky. And they're not going to talk to me anymore. Right. The only thing I can do is, is ask them about their clouds and so, tell me what your clouds, what do they look like? How do they make you feel? Do they come and go? Are they always there? Are there good clouds and bad clouds? 
Tell me about your clouds. And then I've got to bite my tongue and just resist with every fiber in my body, not to tell them why they're wrong. Yes. Yes. Because uh, that's what it, that's what it means to be able to have someone open up to you about their mental health is to let them know that I'm not going to fix you. I'm not trying to fix you. I'm just here to listen because they don't want to be fixed. They just want someone to talk to. Right. And that is something that's really hard for people to understand. I didn't understand it. I honestly didn't. It took me years to go, okay, that's what this is really all about because I fix stuff. People come to me all day long with problems and I fix problems. That's what I do. Oh, that's not working. Go do this. That's it. Next call. That's not how you, you can't deal with that with people with mental health issues. Right. You've got to just listen, let them get it off their chest. Let them know you love them. Let them know you're there to support them, ask them what they need from you and then leave it alone. When you're, when your son or daughter comes up to you and tells you, I just broke up with my girlfriend and I just feel miserable. I don't know what I want. I don't even know if I want to live. And you say, what the hell? You're 15. Right. You know how many other girls or guys there are out there? And this is absolutely ridiculous. That guy's an idiot. You're the most beautiful girl on the planet. <laughs> and you're going, fix that. No, right. you made it worse. Just listen. And it's so hard to do, right? But if you can just listen, then they'll come back to you the next time they're feeling worse. And then at a certain point, maybe you need to get them some help. But you can be your child's therapist, even and and you need to be. We need to be each other's therapists. Because when you really think about what's a therapist, they ask questions and listen. And most of the time they don't tell you what to do. They just ask you what you think you should do. Yeah. It's not that hard. No offense to all the therapists out there. But we need to do that with each other because there's not enough of you therapists out there to do it for us. And even if you have your child in therapy, great. They're there once a week, twice a week. Maybe if you're rich, they're doing it three times a day. They're still with you most of the time as a parent. You need to own your kid's mental health. It, what do you think? Maybe you've already said this in, in what we've already talked about, but question that's coming up for me is, when I think about this movie, what I wish my parents knew, what do you feel was the big through line, was the big takeaway, it was the big headline after you made the movie? So you created it, you watched it back, and then you're like, this was it. This was the, you know, is there something like that for you? Or maybe it was multiple things, but I'm just well, looking for the big takeaway for you. It's a great question. I don't think anyone's really asked me it quite that way. The one thing I've already told you is how young these kids were. Yeah. The same thing is how intelligent they were. Mm. These are smart kids. These are articulate kids. These are kids that you never would have thought would have had a problem. And they all have problems. We think of, unfortunately, when it comes to mental health and kids, we think of that quiet person sitting alone in the lunchroom by themselves who doesn't have any friends as being the one with mental health problems. Because that's as our generation grew up, I think that's probably what it was. That's the kid you got to worry about who's going to become the school shooter. And I hate to say it, right? And that's what we think. Well, why is that kid sitting alone when they've got a trench coat on? And what, what are they doing? And what are they, what are they writing in that notebook? And maybe you do have to worry about those kids. And we probably, somebody should, right? Absolutely, somebody should. But that high school quarterback doesn't, view the world the way you think he views it. Mm. That cheerleader doesn't think she's as beautiful as the rest of the world thinks she is because their minds just aren't seeing the world that way. So when we think about mental health, we think it, it's hitting all these obscure little people that are not normal. And I'm telling you, no, your kids are normal and could have challenges. And by the way, let's not talk about suicide because you know, the chance of your child or daughter dying of suicide is small. And my, yes, it's number two killer of kids, but all that stuff, right? But it's still a small chance that your son or daughter's going to die of suicide. But there's a big chance with 40% of the population and 40% of kids expressing some kind of massive depression or anxiety issue in the last year. And those numbers keep going up, not down, unfortunately. That your, your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew, somebody you know has had some big depression or anxiety issues. And that's no way to live. We need to help them. You might be. 
John, you you know the the, the secret that's going to come out here pretty quickly is that as business owners, we're all saying the same thing in the last 12 to 18 months. What's up with people? Why aren't they working hard? Why do they keep screwing up? Where did all the good people go? Why won't my people come back to work? And when they do, why do they keep messing up? I hear that all the time. Mm-hmm. I might say it all the time. Not all people, but we all, more than used to be in that category. And people are going, what's going on? Well, let me help you what's going on. We're in the biggest mental health crisis we've ever had as a country. So when I'm not happy with myself, I'm not happy at work. I'm not showing up to do my job the way I could. And God forbid I'm worried about my kid being in the hospital or being close to being suicidal or whatever it might be. I'm not showing up to work the way I used to. We are losing more time and more money to mental health issues in this country than to COVID or RSV or the flu or anything else you think we're losing time to. And we don't do anything about it. Corporations, companies are not educating their people the way they should. Their executive team doesn't know how to talk to their middle managers. The middle managers don't know how to talk to the rank and file. Someone calls up and says, I can't come to work today because my daughter's in the hospital because she attempted made an attempt on her life last night. And our middle managers go, oh, when do you think you'll be back? Because they don't know what to say. Yeah. When it comes to knowing what to say or knowing what to do, you know, maybe we can wrap here with this action step for, I'm going to create two camps, right? One is the parent. What would you say, look, if you have a child and let's, let's maybe narrow it down. Do you have a child that you believe is, has a mental health, is in a mental health crisis in their life, whether or not they've talked about suicide or not? Maybe they've alluded to it. Maybe they haven't. What would you say to the parent? And then I also want to talk about the men who perhaps are listening to this, that it's not their child, but they know of that child. It's a buddy's child. How do they, because, because we built this whole thing on brotherhood and I want to know, you know, what do you do to support the parent or the child? So those two people, right? It's your own child and you know of a child what would be action steps for those two different guys? Great question. Um, your child, your family, your wife, your, you just have to dig in and find a way to connect. Whether that's going for a walk. Have, I love what you do with, with, with your son, Tiger. Having that conversation, not barging into the room to have the conversation, but take him for, take him for a walk or a drive and just say, hey, I'm, I'm really concerned. I love you. Please tell me what's going on. How can I help you? I promise not to judge you. I, finding a way to have that conversation. I wish there was an easy answer to it, but not giving up and not saying just because, you know, you spent 17 years doing it the wrong way. doesn't mean that you can't do it the right way now. Yes to that. And don't feel bad about it. Okay, there's no, there's no room in this world with what we're dealing with for you to feel bad and, and give up on your kids because you feel like you screwed them up. We all screwed them up, all right? Our parents screwed us up. We screwed up our kids. Our kids will screw up their kids. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you do now. So whatever you say, don't give up. Now, this question about other people's kids. We need to say something way too many people have that the five kids over for a sleepover and they see the one kid who's not part of the group and being bullied or picked on and and pulling away by themselves and we the next day the parents come to get them we say oh yeah it was great see ya they were fun it takes a village to fix this problem i don't know if that's a great line or not i'm not necessarily a huge fan of it but it does if you see something say something they're stealing another line if you see something with, with someone else's kid and say, look at it, your kids were over, your kid was over. And I just, I just want to share with you what I saw. It's probably nothing. Maybe it's something, I don't know, but he, you know, he was kind of detached from the rest of the group where they, they were picking on him. I don't think he liked it very much. I'm not sure he had a great time here. Um, maybe 
you could grab a conversation and see how they're doing. Because I, you know, I know that mental health issues are big all over the place. I'm not saying your kids got any issues, um, but you know, if you're, if you're curious, you know, go to tell my story.org. I, I looked at a couple of podcasts and TEDx talks on there and I just, it's, it's on my mind thought maybe it was on yours. I just want to share with you. Yeah. <clears throat> but say That's, something. Yeah. Say something. I mean, what I hear is, is I hear engage. I hear connect. I hear, you know, step into this conversation. I also hear like, we're all going to mess it up to some degree. I had this conversation recently with, um, so uh, here's a quick story just to wrap this from my side, Jay, is that I shared with you earlier, my wife's in Peru for a yeah. couple months. I have uh, a, a helper that I hired for the kids to help them get them around. Got one kid going one direction to school, another kid. And, and you know, recently this, this conversation came up about three kids in the car and this helper and she came to me and she's like, this is what I saw, right? She was like, right, yeah. this is what I saw. And then I had this whole conversation with her about how, how I view her role and her ability to influence kids. But here, here's why I tell you this. I say there's extremes. There's like, you know, you can beat my child, <laughs> you know, within an inch of their life. They say it is on one extreme. On the other extreme is you can't say or touch another child. Because this came up like, am I allowed to like grab him by the hand? Am I allowed to pull him yeah. along? Am I allowed to? Yeah. And I'm like, I think there's this, you can go too far either side, right? You, of course, like most things. But the one thing we can't be afraid to do is engage. We can't be afraid to have the conversation because we're afraid we're going to say something wrong or we're not going to eat, right? Like all of this is about getting in there and having a conversation, even if it's uncomfortable and navigating your way through and trying to be conscious, trying to be considerate, but yes, be courageous also. And don't give up on the conversation. Don't give up on the person. Stay with it. That's what I hear. Am I hearing it correctly from what? Uh, absolutely. And, and that's absolutely what I'm saying. And I'll give you one other piece to this, because I think that sometimes when we have these conversations, people think that, so you want me to be a free range parent and let my kids do whatever they want to do because that'll make them feel better. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying be in tune with your kids so you know what they're feeling. That's right. right. But there should be rules. I had rules. And I always joke about my rules with my kids. It's like from day one, I didn't have a lot of rules. No motorcycles. No offense to those of you who ride motorcycles. like they're freaking dangerous. Um, no hard drugs. It used to be no drugs at all until I spent too many nights at dinner <laughs> arguing over the benefits of medical marijuana. I said, fine. No hard drugs. Yeah. No tattoos. Because I didn't think that at under the age of 18, they should make a decision on a tattoo and no drinking and driving. And by the way, here's how I said to them. You have free will. You can break any of those rules that you want to break, right? But understand my commitment to those rules. When you're 18, I'm done with my commitment to having to finance any part of your life. And when you're older, you're going to want favors from me. And I can choose to say yes or no to those favors. <laughs> That's great. And I'll be in a situation where I can say yes and I can help change your life or I can say no and I can ignore you. If you broke those rules in any way whatsoever, I will say no to your favors. Yeah. And those are only four little rules you got to follow. Four, it's it. Four. Yeah. It. So give your kids a chance to win. Give your chance, kids a chance to lose and feel like they're not going to lose the world, right? But have some boundaries and make sure they're important boundaries you care about. You don't have to use mine. I actually got a tattoo after Ryan passed. Um, and my kids are still like, can I have one? Can I not have one? I'm not sure. <laughs> hey, by the way, um, I, I know we got to wrap because you got another call. Um, yeah. I, I want to thank you for being here, Jason, and, and, and this conversation again. A um, couple things I want to say. First is I hope people go watch the movie, What I Wish My Parents Knew. Best way to access all the resources well, is tell. Really quickly, tellmystory.org will take you to the 
trailer for what I wish my parents knew. The only way to see what I wish my parents knew is to have a school program because just watching it by yourself is too raw. You need to have someone walk you through what happened. It was not designed to be on Amazon Prime. It's meant to be a school program. Mm -hmm. I'd love your help getting into your schools. We have a whole team of people putting into schools across the country. Reach out on tellmystory.org. Myself and my team will get back to you. If you want to talk to me, just tell me you want to talk to me and I'll talk to you. But I want to get this into schools and, and change lives across America. Good Thank distinction. You. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I also, on a light note, want to end with the fact that we started this podcast with you talking about you were not that healthy as a child. And, you know, maybe you weren't that athletic, but you're wearing an Ironman t-shirt today. So I want to just, uh, I, I want to acknowledge that things can change. <laughs> I was less athletic than my son who I boxed. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yes, I've done multiple Ironmans. I have retired from Ironmans. I've retired from racing in general. Uh, but yeah, I went through in my 30s and 40s the whole phase of you know martial arts and Ironmans. But what a same as what, 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 ultra, what, ultra. what a what a what a great way to know that the story can always change. Um, we can change. Our kids can change. We we evolve over time. And um, Jason, thanks for helping us evolve, brother. Appreciate you, know you being here. John, yeah. your your last point was was so important. Your story is always evolving. Yeah, it's always evolving. Your story is not set. If you're struggling right now, your story is not set. If you think you're on top of the world, trust me, your story is not set. It's always evolving, and how you deal with that evolution is what matters. Yeah, that's it. All right, Jason, we'll wrap there. Thanks, brother. Appreciate yeah, thanks, you being here. Thanks, buddy.